The passage today is Matthew 18, 1 to 14, found on page 872 of your Pew Bibles. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, So who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child and had him stand among them. Truly I tell you, he said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offences, for offences will inevitably come, but woe to that person by whom the offence comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. See to it that you don't despise one of these little ones. Because I tell you that in heaven their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the ninety-nine on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep, more than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. This is the word of the Lord. You might want to keep your Bibles open there. Let me pray, and then we'll get into that passage. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can call you Father, because we are your children. We thank you that you have made it possible for sinners to be holy children, acceptable in your sight. Father, as we look at that today, help us to understand and teach us and change us by your word, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as you walk through the main shopping areas of Australia's capital cities, you'll often come across people selling a magazine. It's called The Big Issue, and the people are either homeless or disadvantaged in some way. You've probably seen them on the corners. They mon the money they raise from selling the magazine goes to support themselves and others in similar situations. Now, a former Premier of New South Wales tried it for an hour one year, and afterwards said, it's a great way to disappear. People don't want to see you. They avoid eye contact. They'll walk around you. They don't want to give the time or money necessary to engage with the people selling the magazine. Now that's a big issue. Not just the homelessness and the disadvantage, but the way we treat them. But we're going to look at another issue today, an even bigger issue. And according to Jesus, it's the big issue. And many people don't want to recognise or engage with this issue either. Now, it's a couple of weeks since we looked at Matthew's Gospel. When we were last here, Jesus had just been transfigured. His glory had been revealed to Peter, James and John. When he came down from that mountain, a man whose son had a demon that the disciples who had, had been unable to cast out met him. And we saw that the disciples had grown in their understanding of what was going to happen to Jesus. They've started to realise some things, but their faith was still misplaced. And Jesus got a little frustrated with them. He wondered... You unbelieving and perverse generation, 
how long will I be with you? Now he's talking about his disciples there. Yet he was still very patient with them. And Bernard had a question for us. Are we following the real Jesus, the Jesus we meet in Matthew's Gospel? Now, the day we turn to chapter 18. Here, Matthew brings us a passage of teaching, and it's Jesus' teaching about the community of disciples, how they are to relate to each other. And Jesus begins this teaching when he answers a question that the disciples bring to him. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, the disciples are not asking a general question about everybody in the kingdom of heaven. They're not asking whether a Moses or Elijah, for instance, is greater. They're just asking about themselves. Now, we don't see that here, but we see it in Luke's gospel. He says that prior to asking their question, the disciples have been arguing among themselves about which one of them is the greatest. Now, it's the sort of question our world often thinks on, isn't it? Who's the greatest, Bradman or Tenduka? Who's the greatest fullback, Billy Slater or James Tedesco? Even children argue about who's best in the playground, don't they? The disciples' question comes from worldly thinking. They've accepted that Jesus is the Messiah, they've realised that. Now, because they're his closest followers, they think they'll be ruling by his side. Two weeks ago, Bernard said the disciples were growing in their understanding. They are. They are. But this question shows that they have not yet understood the nature of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't answer their question straight away, does he? He calls a young child to him and says, Truly I tell you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Truly I tell you, that lets us know that what Jesus says next is important. And what he says is, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter. Now you can imagine the disciple. hang on, hang on, we're your closest followers. We thought we were in the kingdom and we're going to be great in it. Now you're telling us we must become like little children. Children aren't great. What are you telling us? To put um, Jesus' statement in Aussie colloquialism, not so fast, boys. Make sure you're in the kingdom first. Turn around. Do not go the way you are going. Don't worry about who's greatest. Worry about whether you're in the kingdom. Come as a little child to your saviour. Repentant disciples admit they can have no earned status before God. They cannot do anything to make themselves great in the kingdom of heaven. They depend solely on God's love and whatever he grants them. This child was very small. Young children know that they have needs and that they are dependent on others. Young children are not innocent or selfless. Rather, they are weak, lowly. They're at the mercy of adults. If they have a problem, they look for an adult to fix it for them. They trust adults to help them and provide for them. They're receivers, not givers. Humble yourself. Depend on Jesus. So here's a reminder to remain that way, a dependent child. This is the only way to enter the kingdom. And it's the only question that matters for eternity. Have you relied and depended on, have you repented and depended on Jesus?
And that's the issue, the thread that runs right through this passage. Most of us know that in our heads. We may not want to be great, but many of us want to do something significant for Jesus. Now that desire, which is in some ways a good desire, so easily becomes earning. And that's not being dependent. The question that illuminates the difference is, who are we elevating? Ourselves or Christ? Paul helps us in Philippians 1.18. I'll read that verse. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul's joy is that Christ has been proclaimed. It's been proclaimed by people out of bad motives. Is Paul concerned about that? All he's concerned about is that Christ is being elevated. That is all that matters. And that gives him joy. Jesus hasn't even answered the question yet. Only after correcting their thinking about where they are in relation to the kingdom. And then he says, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Again, Jesus is changing their thinking. In the kingdom of heaven, the direction to greatness is not the same as it is in the world. The nature of this kingdom is that the direction to greatness is down into servanthood. What did we read in Philippians 2 today? Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who... Existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Our Lord humbled himself. God the Son became man and was killed. He humbled himself in service to the people who were his enemies, in service to the people who rejected him. The king of this kingdom came down to serve. Jesus says whoever humbles himself like this child, like this tiny little one, this is the one who will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Is he just talking about himself? No. This is the way he sets forward for whoever would be one of his disciples. Down into servanthood. That is the way to greatness in the kingdom. So we can summarise these first four verses in a three-word description of a member of the kingdom of heaven. Repentant, childlike, servant. One who enters the kingdom has turned around, become like a little child, and they have grasped that their king came down to serve and he has shown that in this kingdom the great are servants. The kingdom of heaven will be full of repentant, Childlike servants. Keeping that in mind, let's turn to the rest of the passage. Jesus now switches from talking about how to be a member of the kingdom, kingdom and begins talking about how those in the kingdom are to relate to each other. Now remember that this passage comes after the transfiguration and after Jesus has prophesied his death for a second time. Jesus has turned toward Jerusalem and he's preparing the disciples for when he's gone. 
The care of the flock will soon be their responsibility. It'll soon be their job to look after the little ones. Verses 5 and 6 go together. I'd take the paragraph break out if I could. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. These verses form a contrast. We can have two responses to little ones. We can welcome them or we can cause them to fall. And it results in two contrasting relationships with Christ. We welcome him or we're under judgment. The important issue in the first four verses was entry into the kingdom of heaven for yourself. Entry into the kingdom is still the issue. The difference is that now it's someone else's entry. That's to be important to us. Disciples are to be concerned for the little ones around them. The others who might be children of God. Do we welcome them? Or do we cause them to fall away? And this is serious. Verse 7, verse seven emphasises just how seriously Jesus takes this issue. Woe to the world because of offences, for offences will inevitably come, but woe to that person by whom the offence comes. Now, do you remember when Peter first heard from Jesus that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and die? What did Peter say? Oh, no, Lord, that will not happen to you. And what's Jesus' response? One of his most stinging rebukes. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you are not thinking about God's concerns. Jesus was very angry at Peter. And the word he uses there, we have translated as hindrance, it's the same word used here in verse 7, translated as offences. Jesus was angry then, and he's angry with those who cause little ones to fall. He's angry with the world. Woe to the world. Woe to that person by whom the offence comes. How serious do you think it is if you contribute to a disciple of Christ falling away? Jesus thinks it's very serious. Some people think this passage is against false teachers. It's broader than that. It's not just false teaching that causes disciples to fall away. There are many ways to cause a disciple to fall. Jesus' point to the disciples is we must do all in our power not to cause little ones to fall, all in our power to elevate others. Peter's words, he was trying to be kind to Jesus, wasn't he? Oh, no, Lord, that won't happen to you. But Jesus saw Satan behind them. The kings of Israel caused their people to fall away by not destroying the high places where the false, where the false gods were worshipped. The Pharisees insisted on obedience to a raft of minor rules but weren't compassionate. There's lots of ways to make disciples fall away. And if you haven't already understood that this is serious, Jesus then, use, Jesus then uses the same hyperbole of cutting off limbs and gouging out eyes that he used in the Sermon on the Mount. Then it was the battle against personal sin. Here it's the battle against causing a brother or sister to fall away. This battle is serious and it needs to be fought intently. 
course we're not meant to gouge out an eye if it causes us a sin. That won't stop us sinning. But the language does raise a question for us. How long is it since our battle with sin caused us pain or discomfort? Even a little. Jesus' words here tell us that if we've not experienced loss, pain, or at least discomfort, then we are not taking our battle with sin seriously. And we are not taking our battle for our fellow brothers and sisters seriously. We are too comfortable in our sinful ways. Have you thought about that as a matter of eternal life or death, the impact you have on your brothers and sisters around you? The entry of the little ones, the other disciples around you, into the kingdom of heaven. That's the big issue this time. Have you helped them or have you hindered them? Verses 10 through 14 then give another contrast, like the one in verses 5 and 6. We have the warning not to despise the little ones, contrasted with the father who searches for the lost. The parable of the lost sheep is very familiar to us, isn't it? And from it we get that wonderful glimpse into the father's heart. It's not the will of your father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. What a consolation placed here immediately after the warning against causing one of the little ones to fall, fall away, we can see that Jesus is giving the disciples a picture of the Father's heart so that, his fathers, so that his followers will have the same heart and will also go in search of the lost sheep. But then contrasted with this seeking the ones who have gone astray is despising them. I'm sure we would not think of ourselves as despising those around us. But Jesus' words here to, the, to his disciples tell us that if we don't go in search of the little ones who are going astray, we are despising them. To not pray for those we love who do not know Christ it's a form of despising them. When God presents us with the opportunity to speak, and we do not, it's a form of despising. It's the opposite of loving them. That's a hard word. I hope you can see that entry into the kingdom is the issue at the bottom of this contrast as well. Entry into the kingdom for the little ones who are lost. Do we have the Father's heart for the lost? Are we searching to bring them back to the Father? Or do we despise them? So, brothers and sisters, have you turned and become as a little child before God? Humble, dependent on Jesus. Our sin that causes us to go astray is serious. Woe if it comes between us and entering the kingdom of heaven. So, brothers and sisters, as disciples, as little ones, we are all little ones, are we servants of all our brothers and sisters? Woe to the world that causes little ones to fall away. Woe to each and every one of us that causes a little one to fall away. Woe to us if we do not welcome them. 
Woe to us if we do not seek the little ones who have gone astray, for we have despised them. The servanthood of a true disciple has a specific purpose. It's to help others enter the kingdom of heaven. The love of true servanthood has a direction. It's towards the kingdom of heaven. Entry into that kingdom is the greatest good for each and every person. Are we doing everything we can? to help the little ones, the other disciples around us. You should be able to see that everything revolves around one issue. Are you in the kingdom of heaven? That's the big issue. It's the only eternal issue. Do you belong to Jesus? Is he your king? Let me pray. Father in heaven, sometimes your word is hard. We prayed earlier about being taught and corrected and rebuked. Father, help us to be teachable. Help us to correct. Help us to be rebuked where that is necessary. Father, we thank you for Jesus and his humility. Help us to be childlike, humble, dependent, repentant servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.